response has always been a part of participating in the Lord's Supper. God has never meant that it would be observation alone. But he calls us to respond. In fact, the people of the first century church, when they participated in the Lord's Supper, in a very clear and real way, they were called forth to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That was a very real indication that what they observed and experienced with their eyes became truly applied to their life. At least, at least that was the expectation. So every single time that the church partook of the Lord's Supper, and every single time that we do the same, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. We're proclaiming the gospel. And we're missionizing our own lives as members of his body by demonstrating with our lifestyle what we have experienced through the observation. God indeed has done all that we need through the death, burial, and resurrection. And having observed this, the translation should be into the pure application of how we're responding to the truth. God has always called his people not simply to observe, but to respond in life to what we've observed. This has always been his plan and his purpose for every expression of faith and worship. That we would see his truth. And we would respond. Do you know this is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Have you considered this? The difference between knowledge and wisdom lies in the response to that which the knowledge teaches. Knowledge is an understanding or an observation of the truth. Wisdom is when that knowledge or truth is applied to real life as God has intended. In fact, this is such a significant revelation that a, a large part of the Old Testament is committed to this truth. We call this part the wisdom literature. And as a representation of that wisdom literature, you find the book of Proverbs that defines wisdom as knowledge that has been applied by God's direction. Knowledge becomes wisdom. When applied as God intends, God desires that we respond to the truth we've observed and to respond to it in a way that depicts that his truth is real and absolute and, and, and irrevocably true. I'd like to read to, to you for just a moment some principles that help to guide us in responding to his truth. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and received by grace the forgiveness of sin. You were saying yes to God. Yes to the cross. Yes to Jesus and no to the world. As we discern what it means to be a people who are keeping the yes alive. But we continue to see God's truth and respond to his truth as an expression of our discipleship as an expression of our desire to truly follow Christ? How do we continue to say yes, and particularly as it, as it involves God's truth, his precious word? Well, there are some principles that I believe help us, particularly from the wisdom literature. is Proverbs chapter 3, which shows us how to respond by aligning ourselves with the truth of God and keeping our yes to Jesus alive. And so many times, our yes to God can, if we're not careful, be limited to walking the aisle or, or making a decision or, or checking a box. But as we've placed our faith in Christ and have received by grace his forgiveness of sin, may you and I keep, keep our yes alive as we daily desire to respond to God's truth in the way that he desires we respond. I'd like to share with you just a couple of ways 
from the opening of Proverbs chapter 3 that will help us to be a people who respond to the word of God as we should. A people who say yes. I want to share these thoughts with you. Look first in verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Verse 2 of Proverbs 3. For your length of days and years of life, they'll be blessed and peace will be added to you. Verse 3. Do not let kindness or, or love and truth or faithfulness leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you'll find favor with God and good rapport in the sight of God and man. We prayed through these verses earlier. Now, consider that if we're to express our heart of response to God, there must be involved in our lives action and then adoration. Have you ever considered this? To truly respond to God's truth as he desires, first simply means that we need to be active, and then secondly, we need to give adoration. Both of these are genuine responses to a heart that's desiring to agree with God's truth or God's words. Consider first this call to action. Listen to verse 1. Don't forget my teachings. Now Solomon's the writer here, employed by God to present truth to Israel as if they were the student, or more endearingly, the son. And so God's word speaks to Israel saying, you as my children need to remember, not forget, my teachings. One way that we truly need to have our lives active about God's word is to remember. You know there's two ways to remember. One way to remember is rote memory. That's memorization. In and of itself, it may be okay, but if that's all you have, then uh, the memory is very meaningless. So there is rote memory, uh, memorizing out of routine, but then there's what I like to call passionate memory. And that's what we're being called to here. When the scripture reads, remember, or don't forget my teachings. I hope you're hearing God make that call to you today. Because not rote memory, being able to recall some things that perhaps has been taught to you from childhood up. But having a passionate memory. Uh, let me explain. The word teaching here comes from the word Torah, which can mean divine law, as well as something practical as household teachings. So when we realize that God is giving us, through his divine nature, teachings and truths that are practical for our lives, that bring life, that bring change, that bring growth, well, we must hunger for that truth. That hunger becomes the passionate memory. Remember what God has said. Cling to what he has said. Cling to his teachings and his truth as if your life depended upon it, as if life would, would, be, would be empty without it, and that is the case. Cling to the truths of God passionately as they're your, your meat and your food. And so we remember. But not only do we remember, but we keep. You hear this in verse 1? My sons, do not forget my teachings. Keep my commandments in your heart. How do we stay active about God's word? By keeping. Keeping is the expression of holding so dear to the heart that God's truths enter your spiritual circulatory system. And his truth begins to affect all of you. Here, keeping truth in the heart doesn't simply mean a fondness. I'm fearful that many simply have a fondness for God's word because we're only remembering and wrote what we've learned for years. And we're fond of the word when we hear it as if a familiar refrain of a favorite song. But here, what we're remembering are the truths that we should be taking to heart so indelibly that God's truth becomes a part of our lives as we live and do and act out what he's called us to do. This is when the profession of God's truth becomes practice. Take to heart my teachings. God is crying out to his people. Keep them in your heart so close in the center of your being that your whole life becomes systemic with God's word. That his truths are affecting how you think and, and what you employ through your eyes and, and what you say or don't say. His truths should be affecting us. This is the message of keep the truth to heart. Matt Harmon, a professor of one of our universities in Baptist Life, says this. There are three simple questions we ask when we open God's word. 
God, what would you have me understand? God, what would you have me believe? And God, what would you have me do? James instructed this in James chapter 1, verse 25, when James says, don't be a forgetful hearer, be an effectual doer. Do you remember that exhortation? Don't be a forgetful hearer. Be a effectual doer. We act upon God's word by remembering and then by keeping his teachings close to our hearts so that his teachings become a part of who we are. But you know, even that type of activity can be mimicked and mirrored without meaning. Did you know that? Because our action would be bankrupt without adoration. So I move to the second of these two ways that we can truly say yes to God through obeying his word. First is action by doing what his word has said, by acting it out. But secondly, as we live it out, we're living it out for one purpose. That purpose is defined in our adoration of God. Listen to verse 3. Do not let loving kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your hearts. Then you'll be in favor with God and man. Oh, this is an incredible picture of, of a devotion to God. Notice these two phrases. Do not let kindness. That comes from the Hebrew hesed or kesed, meaning loving kindness. This is a directive from the worshiper to the one being worshipped, from the student to the teacher, from the child of God to God. Do not let your loving kindness be absent from your life. The love that you are to have for the Father. And do not let truth leave you. The word truth here actually means trustworthiness or faithfulness. This is covenant language. God is instructing through his word that we would not forget the covenant God's made with us through Christ. And in response to that, loving him and being faithful to him as a covenant recipient as one who's been changed by Christ our motivation is adoring the God who gave himself for us action and adoration we're adoring him by obeying him and we can't obey him without truly adoring who he is as the giver of life and love for then our activity is just that it's it's action with no depth. But our activity, the desire to do God's word, must be accompanied with our love for God and for his truth and his word. Oh, I love the phrase, bind them around your neck. These are terms of endearment. Can you imagine a husband and wife being at the altar and the minister performing the ceremony? And the minister saying, will you place this ring on your on your bridegroom and the young lady places the ring on the husband's uh, in the husband's hand and the husband looks at it and says that is nice and he sticks it in his pocket and his comment is uh, i'm so glad you gave me that if i ever need it i'm going to pull it out if it's ever necessary i'll use it that's not binding one's life we would all label that a hypocritical notion when god has given us his word it is that bond of covenant we obey not because we're trying to achieve we obey in response to what he's done we don't pull this out when we need it it is our life this is our this is our message from and to the father this is his truth no one can take that truth from you this is god's truth because of Christ, his truth is alive. And we adore him, the giver of truth. Active. God, I will do your word. I will, I will obey what you've instructed. Adoration. And God, my action is based upon my love for you. That's how you say yes, through responding to the truth. So this morning, unashamedly, the message calls every one of us to an obedience to the scripture based on the motivation of the sacrifice. Oh, may we respond with a yes as God continues to lead his people by being active in doing his word, but not absent of adoring him as our motivation for obedience. May we be active. May we adore our Savior. And may we go forward as a people following the truths of God and living in his truths for the glory of Christ. And the church said, let's stand for prayer.